Hello, and welcome to the June edition of Sepsis Chatter. Today's presentation is titled Septic Shock, Onset of Persistent New Hypotension, and Vasopressor Administration. The information included in this presentation is based on the CMS Specifications Manual for National Hospital Inpatient Quality Measures, versions 5.13 and 5.14. The goal for this presentation is for the attendee to be able to identify patients who will need to be assessed for persistent or new hypotension, apply the allowable values per current specifications manual guidance, determine if a vasopressor is warranted, know which medications will meet the data element requirement, calculate the acceptable time frame to administer a vasopressor based on the presentation of septic shock, and finally, select the correct date and time that the vasopressor was administered. Let's do a quick review of what constitutes septic shock. First, provider documentation. Inclusion terms are septic shock, severe sepsis with shock, and sepsis with shock. Septic shock can also be met per clinical criteria. The first way that clinical criteria can be met is severe sepsis with an initial lactate result of equal to or greater than 4.0. Please keep in mind that the initial lactate result of equal to or greater than 4.0 is the value that will determine septic shock. Please refer to the current specifications manual for guidance in selecting the correct initial lactate collection date and time. The second way clinical criteria can be met is severe sepsis with initial hypotension that meets criteria for persistent hypotension in the hour following the completion of the target volume ordered. This would equal septic shock, the last two blood pressures collected within the hour following the completion of the full target volume of fluids. Let's do a data element review. Persistent or new hypotension is present when the full target volume of crystalloid fluids have been administered and within the hour following completion, there are two consecutive hypotensive blood pressure readings. If multiple blood pressures are documented within that hour, review the last two consecutive blood pressures within the acceptable time frame. When determining the onset time of persistent or new hypotension, use the time of the second hypotensive reading. We need to consider the following information in order to determine if persistent or new hypotension is present. First, what qualifies as hypotension? A systolic blood pressure of less than 90 millimeters of mercury or a MAP of less than 65 millimeters of mercury. For the pregnant patient, systolic blood pressure of less than 85 millimeters of mercury or a MAP of less than 65 millimeters of mercury. For both of these patient types, a systolic blood pressure drop of greater than 40 millimeters of mercury that is attributed to infection or sepsis applies as well. Second, are the hypotensive values excluded due to documentation that they are normal for that patient due to a chronic condition or due to a medication? Remember that hypotensive values collected while in the OR or certain interventions would not be included. So did the patient qualify to receive crystalloid fluids in the first place? For the patient with severe sepsis accompanied by initial hypotension, was the criteria for initial hypotension met based on the definition and within the acceptable time frame? If so, did both hypotensive values occur prior to the completion of the full target volume of crystalloid fluids? If not, then we would answer no to initial hypotension, and if septic shock was not met by another method, then the fluids would not be required and abstraction would stop when the presence of septic shock question in the algorithm is answered no. As mentioned earlier, for the patient with severe sepsis and a lactate result that is greater than or equal to 4.0, did the elevated lactate collection meet the definition of the initial lactate collection? Is the result excluded for some 
provider documented reason. Once it's verified that the patient requires crystalloid fluids to be given, it's important to know how to calculate the correct full target volume based on the patient's weight and the time the target volume was completely infused to know when to start and stop evaluating for persistent or new hypotension. Note, if the fluids are ordered and administered at a lesser volume, the requirement to assess for persistent or new hypotension still applies. The lesser volume is now considered the target volume for abstraction purposes. Moving on to acceptable values that you would select when answering the question, was persistent hypotension or new onset of hypotension present within one hour of when the target ordered volume of crystalloid fluids was completely infused? So the acceptable values are, one, yes, persistent hypotension or new onset of hypotension was present within the one hour of when the target volume of crystalloid fluids was completely infused. Value two, no or uh, unable to be determined, persistent hypotension or new onset of hypotension was not present within one hour of when the target ordered volume of crystalloid fluids was completely infused or unable to determine. Value three, no, the patient was not assessed for persistent hypotension or new onset of hypotension within one hour of when the target volume ordered volume of crystalloid fluids was completely infused. And four, not applicable, crystalloid fluids were administered but at a volume less than the target ordered volume. I'd like to review additional guidance for selecting the correct allowable value before going through some examples. If two or more blood pressures are documented, refer to the last two consecutive blood pressures within the hour. Select value 1 if there's a low blood pressure followed by another low blood pressure. Select value 1 if there's a normal blood pressure followed by a low blood pressure and the vasopressor was administered. Select value 2 if there's a normal blood pressure followed by another normal blood pressure. Select value two if there's a normal blood pressure followed by a low blood pressure. Select value two if there's a low blood pressure followed by a normal blood pressure. And finally, select value three that the patient was not assessed for a persistent or new hypotension when the only blood pressure measured within the hour following fluid completion is hypotensive. For the question, is persistent or new hypotension present? Select yes, value one, when two or more blood pressures are documented within the acceptable time frame, and the last two values are both hypotensive. Abstract the latest time of the last consecutive hypotensive values documented. In this case, it would be 9.58. Of note, the question for this data element does not require that a date or time be abstracted. However, it is necessary to know the exact onset time to determine the presence of septic shock in the setting of severe sepsis with initial hypotension. In addition, if fluids are ordered and administered within the acceptable time frame, but are completed greater than six hours following the onset of septic shock. This means that the assessment would be, would be required to be performed greater than six hours following septic shock, which, in which case we would answer no to persistent or new hypotension and a vasopressor would not be required. Let's review additional guidance related to selecting value one, yes, for persistent or new hypotension present. If two or more blood pressures are documented, refer to the last two consecutive blood pressures within the hour. Select value one if there is a low blood pressure followed by another low blood pressure, as in the previous example. Select value one, yes, 
if there is a normal blood pressure followed by a low blood pressure and a vasopressor was administered. In this example, the last two blood pressures include one normal and one hypotensive reading. Persistent or new hypotension is met at 958. In addition, a vasopressor was administered within the acceptable time frame defined in the specifications manual as at the onset through six hours following the onset of septic shock. Let's review additional guidance when only one blood pressure is measured within the hour. We would select value one if the only blood pressure within the hour is hypotensive and a vasopressor was administered. You would select value two if the only blood pressure within the hour is within normal limits. You would select value three if there was no blood pressure or the only blood pressure is hypotensive. In this example, there is only one blood pressure measured and it's hypotensive. Because a vasopressor is administered, we will answer value one, yes, rather than value three, not assessed for persistent or new hypotension, and move on to the next data element in the algorithm. Of note, in order to select value one, the vasopressor must be given within the acceptable time frame starting at the onset of septic shock through six hours following the onset of septic shock. Let's review when value two, no, would be selected for persistent or new hypotension present. We would select value two if there's a normal blood pressure followed by another normal blood pressure. We would also select value two if there was a normal blood pressure followed by a low blood pressure. We would, finally, we would select value two if there's a low blood pressure followed by a normal blood pressure. In this example, there's a blood pressure within normal limits followed by a hypotensive blood pressure. Since a vasopressor was not administered, we would answer value two, no and a vasopressor would not be required. Of note, the scenario on slide number seven includes the same blood pressure measurements in the same order. One blood pressure that was within normal limits, followed by a hypotensive blood pressure. Because a vasopressor was administered in that case, we would select value one, yes, for persistent or new hypotension. In this example, the last two blood pressures measured are within normal limits. We would answer no to new or persistent hypotension present, and a vasopressor would not be required. In this example, select value three. The patient was not assessed for persistent or new hypotension when the only blood pressure measured within the hour following fluid completion is hypotensive. The only blood pressure measured was 80 over 60 at 935. Note that no vasopressor was administered. This would be an opportunity for improvement based on the fact that this patient was not assessed for new or persistent hypotension. Now that we know how to determine the presence of persistent or new hypotension, we will move on to vasopressor administration. Let's assume that criteria for persistent hypotension has been met. The list of acceptable vasopressors for septic shock, table 5.2, can be found in the current specifications manual located in Appendix C. Next, let's review the data element, vasopressor administration. The definition of vasopressor administration. Documentation of administration of an intravenous or intraosseous vasopressor within a specified time frame. The question, was an intravenous or intraosseous vasopressor administered within the specified time frame? Value one, yes, or value two, no. The specified time frame for administration of a vasopressor starts at septic shock presentation time 
and ends six hours after the septic shock presentation time. For severe sepsis plus initial hypotension that progresses to septic shock by the presence of persistent hypotension, a vasopressor is required to be administered within the acceptable time frame. For provider documented septic shock or septic shock met by severe sepsis and an initial lactate of equal to or greater than 4.0, the full target volume of crystalloid fluids are required to be administered, and if persistent hypotension is determined to be present, a vasopressor is required. Of note, for septic shock with no initial hypotension, but new hypotension is present after fluid completion, then a vasopressor will be required. If there's no persistent new hypotension present, we would move on to the repeat volume status and tissue perfusion assessment in the algorithm. The following information must be documented in order to accept that a vasopressor was actually administered. The provider order, the name of the medication, the route, IV or IO only, date and time of administration, and the qualified person who administered the medication. As a side note, there is one exception to the acceptable time frame when abstracting the time of vasopressor administration. For vasopressors running at the time of the onset of septic shock, abstract the date and time that the vasopressor was started. An example would be the onset of septic shock is 10 a.m. Norepinephrine infusion was started at 8.30 and continues to run through the onset of septic shock at 10 a.m. We would still abstract the start time of 8.30 for the vasopressor administration time. Just a few closing tips for abstraction. Know the data element definition and acceptable time frame when assessing for a persistent or new hypotension. Always refer to the current specifications manual when determining which allowable value you will select for your patient's scenario. Selecting the correct allowable value may be based on whether a vasopressor was given or not. The acceptable time frame for a vasopressor administration begins at the onset of septic shock and not when persistent or new hypotension is identified. Please refer to the resources listed for further information. This concludes our presentation today, and I would like to thank you very much for attending, and happy abstracting.